Good afternoon, everyone. We have a, a large program of awards to do here today before our keynote speaker, so we're going to get started with that. Um, I'd like to introduce Sue Detweiler from the EPA Alaska Operations Office to present our first award. Thank you, Kurt. Um, good afternoon. My name is Sue Detweiler. I'm the Alaska Operations Director for EPA here in Alaska. Um, Alaska, as a state, is part of EPA's Region 10, which includes um, three other states, Washington, Idaho, and Oregon. So thank you for letting us present this award here at the conference. And today I'm excited to be able to honor Alaska student Robert McGinnis from Nanilchik. He was selected as EPA Regions, Region 10's Honorable Mention 6th to 12th grade winner of the President's Environmental Youth Award Program. His project is the more you care, the more you recycle. And I also wanted to acknowledge his mom, Lara McGinnis. Um, she's in the audience, waving. And his project sponsor, Meryl Sikorsky, who was not able to be here today, but she's from the Caring uh, for Kenai program. Since 1971, the President's Environmental Youth Award program has encouraged individuals, school classes, summer camps, and youth organizations to promote environmental awareness and positive community involvement. Each year, young people from around the country, from kindergarten through high school, are invited to participate in this program. And I'm very proud to be here today on behalf of the President and EPA to honor Robert and the incredible work he's done in his community. And I'd like to read you a couple of ex excerpts from his award nomination. Robert came up with an idea in 2014, and by 2015, he had formed a nonprofit organization and a recycling business. He was in about eighth or ninth grade at, at the time. So he's quite accomplished. Um, he wanted to increase recycling events held around the Kenai Peninsula. He had volunteered at the Kenai Peninsula Fair and knew how hard it was to get recyclable items to the transfer site because the cost was prohibitive. He attended other events over the summer and learned that it was too expensive to pay for a con container truck to be on site for the events. So. Robert came up with a solution that they needed a mobile recycling unit that could go to these events and take the recyclables from the event to the transfer t station at little or no cost to the event holders. So in 2014, he submitted his idea through the Caring for the Kenai contest and was a finalist. And by August of 2015, he had a trailer donated and was given his first sponsorship by sponsorship check by the Soldatna Rotary. And by 2017, he was able to take the trailer to five events and help with the 4-H highway cleanup project. Robert also built a portable sorting station that would slide out of the truck to make it easier to re uh, sort the recyclables. His project has made it easier for event organizers to collect and dispose of recyclables at the event and reduce the, the landfill from filling up so fast. So Robert's idea has now been picked up by a local nonprofit organization called Regroup and is still being used. So congratulations, Robert. Here's your back. So, so just one last comment, Robert, and uh, you and the other award winners are making a difference and will have an impact on the environment and for future generations to come. So thank you very much. We have a series of other awards to give out today. and. Um, 
president of our board of directors, Doug Mutter, is going to start that process. And Jennifer Coleman, who's helping with the Green Star program, will be assisting. And I'll just be the eye candy on the side. Howdy again. Welcome to the Alaska Forum on the Environment. Uh, keynote luncheon and also our second presentation of Green Star Awards. Uh, this one is for businesses and organizations. Uh, and they're all working toward the goal of reducing environmental impact and restructuring their operations to think green. This year we're awarding 10 businesses that have either completed the process to earn their Green Star Award or have renewed their existing Green Star program. The Green Star program supports businesses and organizations that wish to, wish to practice waste reduction, energy conservation, and pollution prevention through education, technical assistance, and a nationally recognized voluntary green business certification program. By meeting the Green Star standards, organizations demonstrate to the public that they have gone well beyond compliance with environmental regulations and have voluntarily implemented a thorough waste prevention and pollution prevention plan. And I ask you, either during lunch or sometime today, turn to page 32 of your programs, and there's a description of each of the businesses and the kinds of things they've done to earn this award. Our first business to receive their Green Star Award is Linden Transport. Would someone come up to receive their award? Linden Transport. The second business to receive their Green Star Award is another Linden business, Alaska West Express. Our third business, Linden Air Cargo and Linden International. I think Linden's got the program well in hand. Our fourth business today is Donalyn Gold. Congratulations, Donalyn Gold. Fifth business today to earn their Green Star Award is K&L Distributors. Our sixth business is Matanuska Telephone Association.
final business to receive the Green Star Award today is the K3 Group. So let's give a big thank you to all this year's Green Star Award programs. We really appreciate the work they're doing. Now it's time to recognize an annual award that the Alaska Forum on the Environment uh, awards, and that's for outstanding achievement recognized on a project, program, or group that's contributed to the advancement, education, cooperation, or management of the environment and our natural resources of Alaska. Changes in the Arctic did not happen overnight, and some of the challenges such as climate change cannot be solved overnight. Younger generations will play an important role in addressing these challenges of the future. This year's winner, the Arctic Youth Ambassador Program, brings together diverse youth from across Alaska to serve as emissaries for their communities and this country in building awareness at home and abroad about life in the Arctic. Originally established by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the U.S. Department of State in partnership with the nonprofit Alaska Geographic, Arctic Youth Ambassadors have been involved in programs and meetings around Alaska, in other states, and as far as Norway, Iceland, and France. Some of these activities included, included attending Capitol Hill Ocean Week, the nation's premier annual conference examining current marine, coastal, and Great Lakes policy, and the fifth, our Ocean Conference in Bali last year to contribute to discussions on ocean sustainability. The program director for this outstanding program is someone very familiar to AFE. I believe she's related to Victoria and Elaine. And she's been active in youth programs since grade school in her home in Yakutat, where she has led community trash pickups and other activities for the local chapter of Alaska Youth for Environmental Action. She was also awarded the Bill Gates Millennium Scholarship. She's currently attending college, and she participates in the Youth Ambassador Program. So let's congratulate the program, Arctic Youth Ambassadors, and their program director, Maka Montour Paki for their outstanding work in raising awareness. Oh, there's a whole bunch of them. <laughs> Back to you. Back to you. So uh, last year, when we were giving out awards, uh, we got feedback, and in fact, if you have any feedback on our conference, you can email us at info at akforum.org. You can leave a note in the message box up front. We are always interested in your input. Um, we, we can collect it through the app as well, but we appreciate uh, ideas. But we did change some things this year, so we hope that you will provide us input. One of the inputs we got last year was that I'm no longer allowed to be in the photos because there's too much glare and reflection. <laughs> so we had Jennifer do that instead of me. Um, I would like to introduce uh, Anna Deal with a, a Linden Family Company. She's going to actually introduce our keynote speakers. Uh, it's really important you all take time to look at what the businesses did for, during their Green Star Awards. Um, and we asked Linden uh, to give an example of that for you today. But please take time to look at your program and read through that work they do. It's an amazing amount of recycled materials, amazing amount of effort that all these businesses do. So thank you all. And Anna Deal. Thank you. On behalf of Linden, I'd like to say thank you to Green Star. Green Star has been a great partner uh, since our original certification 10 years ago, and we based much of the structure of our green initiative programs on that Green Star framework. Um, by using a common sense approach, we've found that going green is just good business and has been strongly supported by our people and our customers. By continually thinking outside the box, we've found innovative solutions to meet customer needs with less impact to the environment. 
And by looking at problems through a green lens, we've been able to find efficiencies that otherwise might have gone unnoticed. Our people are proud to identify as environmentally responsible and continually look for new opportunities to do more with less. We've found that many small changes can add up to big savings for Linden and the environment. For example, by investing in modern, lightweight, aerodynamic equipment, maximizing our payload per trip, and continually refining our, the efficiency of our processes, we've been able to increase the freight efficiency of our fleets by over 20% saving more than a million and a half gallons of diesel per year and reducing air pollutants by nearly 70%. Energy efficiency, yeah, thank you. <laughs> energy efficiency upgrades across the Linden facilities have reduced our energy costs by half a million dollars per year. Several of our facilities have cut their energy use by 30 to 50% and all of our upgrades have had less than a three year return on investment. We go above and beyond to prevent pollution from our stormwater and to operate with the highest regard for safety and the environment. While we do everything we can to operate safely and prevent accidents in our own operations, Lyndon has earned the nickname 911 for our leadership in disaster recovery in Alaska and worldwide. We've responded to the Exxon Valdez oil spill with vessels, equipment, and personnel, and to the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico with our Hercules aircraft. The Linden companies responded to the Dalton Highway ice flood in 2015 with aircraft and truck equipment. And our Connect Construction rebuilt the Minnesota and International exit ramp in three days after the recent earthquake. Our aircraft and personnel respond to hurricanes, floods, earthquakes, and famine anywhere in the world on a regular basis. So when it comes to responding to major environmental incidents throughout the world, we have a lot in common with today's speaker. Gary Shiganaka is a senior biologist with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Emergency Response Division in Seattle. He's provide bio provided biological and shoreline assessment during spills of oil and hazardous chemicals domestically and internationally over the last three decades. Gary was part of the early scientific mobilization for the 1989 Exxon Valdez oil spill in Alaska and monitored the long-term effects in Prince William Sound through 2013. He also worked the 2010 Deepwater Horizon oil spill out of the Louisiana Forward Command Post, focusing on a wide range of biological issues. And something else I recently learned that we both have in common, Gary and I both have a passion for growing heirloom apple trees. Uh, Gary has a cabin in the San Juans where he enjoys doing nothing and also planting unusual um, trees, such as the ancient variety of apple from Kazakhstan. So please join me in welcoming Gary Shaganaka. Thank you, Anna. Uh, thank you, Kurt. Um, hello, everybody. This is a much bigger crowd than uh, I had been anticipating, but it is lunch, right? So um, I think it's a little bit like one of those uh, timeshare seminars where you have to go and sit through a lunch and, and then uh, people begin to nod off by the time they get to the cake or the chocolate chip cookie. But hopefully I'll be able to keep you uh, awake maybe through the, the uh, cake. So we'll see how that goes. You know, Kurt, and then Grace never really gave me a subject um, to talk about for my keynote. So, uh, you know, it's kind of a blank check, and you're going to suffer the consequences of that. But um, I, I sort of uh, am going to riff on 30 years of Exxon Valdez and um, mix in some science, a little bit of philosophy, uh, maybe some performance theater and stand-up comedy. So um, we'll see how it goes. So um, my career uh, has, in NOAA has extended across 40 years, and uh, it's 30 years of those 40 have been doing oil spill response and kind of bookended by the Exxon Valdez and then Deepwater Horizon. So um, I, I guess if you just stay in a position long enough, it gives you some 
some gravitas, some authority, so that you can do keynote addresses. But um, this is going to be my perspective on, on uh, what it all means and um, how it all fits together. So um, hopefully you'll, you'll uh, take away a little bit of understanding at the end of this. So I do a lot of um, classes, and I do a lot of talks on the science of oil spills and shoreline assessment, and I usually try to tell people what I'm going to talk about at the very beginning and then revisit it at the end. And I realize that maybe that's a little stodgy and, and too structured, so uh, we're going to go with a little bit of a different um, agenda for my talk. And we'll start off with an introduction and a little bit of background. But um, what I'd like to do is uh, put it into the, Ex well, put, take the Exxon Valdez, put it into a little bit of a historical context, because I think that's really important. Um, I want to talk about uh, three important pieces of science that I think came out of the Exxon Valdez spill. The fate of the Exxon Valdez, um, I don't know if all of you know what happened to the ship itself. It's kind of a, an interesting and sad story. Irony. I'm really big into irony, so um, we're going to wind up with that. And I'll talk, Grace wanted me to talk a little bit about this bizarre collection I have related to the Exxon Valdez, so I'll tell you a little bit about that at the end. And then we'll wrap up with me apologizing for what I've just put you through. <coughs> so this is probably a good, good time to put up my standard disclaimer. Um, I will tell you now that uh, if anybody asks me if I was here giving this talk, I'm going to deny it. And as far as that goes, it brings up an interesting point that um, this, this conference was scheduled in kind of an awkward time for the federal government. Um, and as we were planning my, my trip up here, there was some question about how I would get here and under whose authority I would be speaking. So I did prepare a, a contingency slide uh, to make sure that I didn't violate any government rules. Um, <laughs> Fortunately, I don't need to use this slide today, um, and from what I hear, I'm going to be able to get home after the conference um, after Friday. So it's all good news, right? Um, some of you may know that I have this interest in uh, both the history of oil and the history of oil spills. So that gives me a little bit of material to work with here to try to put the Exxon Valdez into a, a historical context. And so last week, I was in New Orleans uh, attending a conference called Go Moses, which is kind of a strange acronym, I know, but um, it stands for the Gulf of Mexico Oil Spill Ecosystem and Science Conference. And it is um, sponsored by the uh, Gulf of Mexico Research Institute, which was funded by one of the uh, penalties paid by the BP Corporation after the oil spill at the tune of $500 million. So um, this guy that you see in the picture um, is Dr. Steve Morosky, who used to be the chief scientist for the National Marine Fisheries Service during the Deepwater Horizon spill, and now he is at the University of South Florida. And so um, at the beginning of this conference last week, he um, gave a talk on some of the biological results coming from deep water, um, much deeper water than what we dealt with during the Exxon Valdez spill. But he did um, have an interesting set of phrases on his slides, introductory slides, and you can read them there. The present is the key to the past. The past is the window to the future. And I thought, you know, that's a very nice way to think about the Exxon Valdez, too, and it's also how I tend to think about uh, oil spills and the history of oil spills. Now, I looked up that particular phrase to see where it came from, and the first part came from a guy by the name of Charles Lyle, who was a geologist in uh, Scotland, I believe, and is one of the um, ancestors of modern geology. And so his point in saying 
that the present is the key to the past um, meant that by looking at what goes on around us in the present day, we can begin to understand what we're seeing in the geology of the past. Now, the second half of that phrase about um, the past is the window to the future is a, is a little bit different. And the only reference I could find to that was from the British Antarctic Survey, which uses that as a reason for explaining why they do coring of ice in the Antarctic, to try to understand what's going on there. But if we combine that back into a single phrase, then I think it um, helps to uh, define what the Go Moses people are trying to do now with their program in the Gulf of Mexico, and what we, I think, are trying to do um, in Alaska and in other areas affected by oil spills, trying to put those things into context and look to the future. Now, the guy that you see on the left is going to be familiar to many of you, Dr. Bob Spees, who was the keynote speaker at the Go Moses conference last week. Um, and he was brought in to talk about his experience being the chief scientist for the Exxon Valdez Oil Spill Trustee Council. Um, and then on the right-hand side, you see Bob um, bookended by a couple of other oil spill icons. Some of you may know Jim Payne, who has done a lot of work for the Prince William Sound RCAC, and I believe is going to be going out again this summer to do more work for the RCAC. And then on the right-hand side um, is one of the grandfather chemists for oil spills, a man by the name of John Farrington, who is out of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. So uh, across these three men, you see a history of oil spills, not only in the United States, but in Mexico and in many other places in the world. So again, linkages to the past that bring us to the, to the present and then um, help us to uh, learn our way into the future. So um, here's how I'd like to uh, kind of couch my talk about the Exxon Valdez. We'll look at a little bit of recent and not so recent past, and I'm gonna focus in on uh, a couple of facts. First of all, um, you, know, you often hear that the Exxon Valdez doesn't really measure up in terms of size to a lot of other oil spills. This is a, a graph of tanker spills uh, in history, and you can see that Exxon Valdez is, is not ranking very highly on this particular chart. And in the same way, another way to look at oil spills that include land spills from pipelines or from uh, also from well blowouts, you see that the Exxon Valdez really is kind of a small dot up there. So it's, it's relatively small in a um, a volume scale, but obviously it was very, very important to all of us and to uh, many people around the world. So here's the context that I'd like to put the Exxon Valdez into. It's looking at um, three other spills, uh, one being not in the U.S., but the Torrey Canyon spill in England, and then the second being the Santa Barbara platform blowout in 1969 in Santa Barbara, California, and then, of course, the Deepwater Horizon. First of all, the Torrey Canyon really uh, ushered in the uh, modern age of oil spills. It was the first supertanker spill. Here are just some facts about that particular spill, and I'll do that with each of the, the others as well, just to give you some background. Um, probably notable, uh, this spill anyways, um, in that uh, a lot of uh, chemical dispersants were used. They were first generation, uh, very highly toxic, and uh, wound up causing a fair amount of environmental impact. Also, one of the first bring your child to work days. Um, you can see that our approaches to shoreline cleanup have changed with time. And also, you know, anything that the British do seems sort of whimsical. This is application of dispersants on the shoreline. Um, again, we'll, we'll get into some of the effects of that particular application, but you can see people had very different attitudes about um, both the chemicals that they were dealing with as well as the chemicals they were applying. 
And in terms of the fate of the Torrey Canyon, the RAF decided um, after unsuccessful attempts to salvage her, um, they decided to bomb her into submission. And uh, there was much talk about the fact that on a stationary target, they missed with 25% of their bombs. But eventually, the ship was sunk and it still remains off the coast, southwestern coast of uh, England. So uh, the other thing I wanted to um, touch on is the significance, not from a scientific perspective, but from more of a policy and legislation perspective. So the um, Torrey Canyon really was the impetus to uh, initiate um, a, a bunch of international conventions that dealt with liability and who's uh, at fault, who, who pays for um, spills, particularly in international waters. And then for um, this country, the Torrey Canyon also served as an impetus to begin to structure our own response system. Things like um, the national response team, the regional response teams, um, the Coast Guard strike teams, all of these began to come about as a result of the Torrey Canyon. The Union Oil Platform A um, is the first big American spill, again in California, and some of those facts about this spill. So uh, this spill um, began the cycle of media coverage for oil spills, and um, President Nixon went to Santa Barbara to visit uh, the shorelines and uh, uh, mingle with the workers. Um, I put that lower right photo in there just to show you how shoreline assessment techniques have evolved over time. And I got some of these photos from uh, an artist and an activist in the Santa Barbara area, um, Bud Bottoms, um, and he took these remarkable shots uh, showing the interaction of the oil with people. So a surfer, cormorant on a surfboard, and it's this kind of imagery that really began to um, uh, stick in the American public's mind and really uh, the, the image of oiled wildlife um, became front page um, icons for what was happening with oil spills. The, the Santa Barbara spill was also um, the first in a long line of uh, oil company executives making unfortunate statements that probably they wished they hadn't said, but um, the president uh, of Union Oil at the time, Fred Hartley, uh, made this statement to the Senate about, you know, what's the big deal? It's just a few birds dying. It's not like people are, are getting killed during this oil spill. Um, but as a result of some of these statements and the imagery that came out during this spill, people um, began to get concerned about the environment. And really, we think of the Santa Barbara spill as the beginning of the American environmental movement. And um, despite the fact that Richard Nixon was in the White House, it was under um, his tutelage that a number of significant environmental um, pieces of legislation uh, came to pass and became institutionalized into American law. You can see this long list here. And uh, as well as the first uh, Earth Day came right on the heels of the Santa Barbara spill. So obviously, um, Captain Joe Hazelwood reporting in to uh, Coast Guard Valdez um, in the wake, the early morning wake of the Exxon Valdez. And um, so that brings us to the, uh, the star of, of the talk here, Exxon Valdez. Um, I don't 
need to reiterate all the facts that I think people have been telling you um, during this conference about the Exxon Valdez, and all of you are well aware of many of these uh, metrics related to, to the spill. Again, immense, the largest uh, shoreline cleanup uh, in American history to that point. Um, and I, I sort of focus on this a little bit because that was uh, one of my roles as uh, a response person, a response scientist, was to try to evaluate the effects of some of these um, seemingly intrusive shoreline cleanup techniques. So we studied this for a number of years. Um, this is a shot of the Omniboom, which uh, delivered large amounts of high pressure hot water to the shorelines. Uh, again, um, the public here in Alaska and elsewhere around the country um, began to really resent uh, the, the uh, despoiling of what was largely viewed as a, an unspoiled uh, habitat. And we've learned with time that there's kind of a sequential, a, a long-term recovery process that takes place with biota and in ecosystems that are impacted by oil. So this is just a, a graphic that shows some of the results from the Exxon Valdez Trustee Council studies. Um, you can see that not everything um, took a short time to recover, not everything took a long time to recover. You can see that some uh, resources are either not going to recover or it's very difficult to determine what their status is. So it's a, it's a complex picture that kind of um, foreshadowed what we would be finding in the Gulf of Mexico and with other oil spills that, that followed after Exxon Valdez. So um, people have already talked in some of the other sessions about the uh, Oil Pollution Act of 1990 and the significant changes that um, that particular piece of legislation uh, brought about to how we deal with oil spills in the country. So I won't belabor the points, but these are just some of the things that popped out for me. Which brings us to um, the Deepwater Horizon, the MC Mississippi Canyon 252 uh, Macondo spill uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, which is the largest marine spill in US history. And again, more facts. Um, in this case, uh, tragically, there were 11 deaths of workers on board the platform uh, right during the uh, initial accident that caused the sinking of the platform. And the scale of this thing was uh, just incredible. You know, we don't need to spend too much time because I'm sure, unless you're only 10 years old, that. Um, you recall a lot of the imagery that you saw on the news and elsewhere. Shoreline impacts, uh, again, and, and the intersection of people with oil. Um, this is just one of those bizarre pictures that, that came out of the uh, uh, Deepwater Horizon in Alabama. And kind of a, a waiting for Godot type of pose uh, as this woman contemplates the uh, impacts of the oil spill on what is probably one of her uh, favorite beaches. And uh, resource impacts. Uh, you know, we can take a lot of time and go through pictures of oiled birds and in this case sea turtles and um, even dolphins, but um, you've seen some of these shots before. The, the good news is, um, is that uh, there was a lot of money that was made available for research into the effects of this spill. And on the left-hand side in this shot, you see the uh, PDARP, the preliminary, or the uh, program, final programmatic um, damage assessment and restoration plan for the Gulf of Mexico, which details what the impacts were to the resources in the Gulf, and um, then on the right-hand side, you can see a summary of some of the penalties that BP paid um, to the state and federal trustees and to others uh, because of the spill. 
Now, um, I was trying to find more summary information about research, and um, I did touch base with some of our folks back in D.C., and um, they estimate that about $750 million was spent on NERDA, or Natural Resource Damage Ass Assessment Studies, um, in the wake of the spill, which is a huge amount of money to look at the interaction of oil with the environment. The other interesting thing that I found in preparing this talk is that there's a document that just came out that was um, put out by the uh, General Accountability Office, GAO, um, and it's dated January of this year, and apparently it's a document that was requested by Senator Murkowski to um, compare the Exxon Valdez uh, research that took place after the spill with Deepwater Horizon. So I haven't had a chance to go through this. It's about 60 pages, but it, you can find it online if you're interested. Just came out. Um, you can probably do a search on GAO and uh, oil spill impacts or Deepwater Horizon and Exxon Valdez. So when, you know, the, as I mentioned at the beginning, the, one of the um, benefits that has come out of this spill experience is this particular program, the um, Gulf of Mexico Research Institute and the scientific work that has taken place um, in its wake. So it was a 10-year program uh, funded, again, by $500 million from BP. Uh, and for oil spill research, that's a huge amount of money. But this is the last year. Um, and so now the uh, Gomri, the Go Moses people, are trying to determine their way forward. And uh, to some extent, they've looked north. They've looked to all of you folks. And that's one of the reasons that they invited Bob Spees to come and talk at this most recent meeting. They're looking at how to carry forward into the future and to main, make sure that the momentum that's been built up by this research effort is not lost. So here's the list of legislation passed in the wake of the Deepwater Horizon. Which, okay, is a little snarky. There's, there's a little bit that's, that's been done. The, the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement has um, uh, suggested new rules for uh, drill platforms. And this was done in 2015, and they still are being reviewed right now. So they have not been implemented yet. But um, there hasn't been a whole lot of follow-up. A lot of us who work the spill were expecting the Oil Pollution Act of 2011, that never happened. So I think it's an opportunity missed and an unfortunate one. So I want to talk about the science. And I think I better speed up a little bit here. Um, I, I'm going to talk about shoreline cleanup because that was really my bailiwick and my, my entree into um, Prince William Sound and spending a lot of time up there. And, um, go back to Torrey Canyon, where they uh, used the rather indiscriminately uh, very toxic chemical shoreline cleaners, basically dispersants, um, much more toxic than the formulations now, and again, sprayed very indiscriminately on the shoreline. There were biological follow-up studies uh, done uh, out of the, the uh, government labs there uh, in England. And um, it was found. On the left-hand side, you see some limpets shortly after they've been uh, treated with chemicals. And I believe the, the researchers came back a day or two later. And you can only see the ghostly shadows of where those limpets were. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see at the top right a normal um, uh, rocky intertidal coastline uh, in England. Uh, after being treated with those chemicals, then all of the existing algae was killed off and a very weedy green algae species uh, came back in, um, much as, you know, if you remove your lawn or uh, your, your garden, then weedy species uh, opportunistically come in. So this kind of was in the back of our minds, and it's some of the research that we um, consulted when we were putting together our shoreline monitoring efforts in Prince William Sound. And basically, to, to really cut to the chase, we found that, yes, some of those aggressive techniques 
really did cause more damage than the oil alone, but then the, um, the conditions rebounded, and then after about three, maybe four years, um, there was no difference between the sites that were oiled and the sites that were aggressively cleaned. So I, I guess the take-home lesson is if you w really want to get rid of the oil quickly off the shoreline and you're willing to take the hit to cause a little bit more damage, then you can expect that conditions will recover um, after a period of time. So in, in the, uh, many of you have probably seen this, my colleague, my now retired colleague, uh, Alan Mearns has been going to Snug Harbor or sending his, his um, proxies out to Snug Harbor to take pictures of a single boulder there uh, year after year after year. And rather than uh, reflecting oil spill damage, what it has reflected for us is the incredible inherent variability in the intertidal environment. And that has implications for us as we try to understand how systems recover from oil spill impacts. So if your background, um, your baseline is changing all the time, then it makes it that much more difficult to understand what the oil is going to do to that changing background. And I, I won't spend too much time here. There was a very interesting paper that I saw last week in New Orleans where a uh, professor out of the University of Georgia um, evaluated marsh um, monitoring programs in the wake of the Deepwater Horizon, and he concluded, much as we did, that you have to take into account um, the inherent variability of the habitats that you're monitoring when you're trying to look at uh, both impact and recovery. So I, I'm not going to spend any time going into this. We can talk about it afterwards if you would like. And during the Deepwater Horizon, we um, integrated some of this thinking into our operational monitoring. In other words, we evaluated a number of cleanup techniques in marshes, which are very hard to clean up, and um, then chose the uh, methods that appeared to do less harm than um, some of the other methods. So in this case, we found that uh, I guess you can't really see that, can you? Um, these are very heavily oiled marsh habitats. We found um, a nice uh, set of sites in um, a place called Barataria Bay, Bay Jimmy, where we set up plots and could test different cleanup methods. And again, just to cut to the chase here, we found that um, if you mechanically cleaned a site and left it, then uh, it tended to do rather poorly. And in fact, it tended to encourage erosion, which is a big deal in places like Louisiana. But if you mechanically clean a site and then replant with, with new plants, new marsh plants, then it does much better. So that's the take home from this. And just a couple more shots of those test plots. So um, scientific uh, study number two, uh, and you've already heard something about this. Here's a shot of a young scientist, fisheries biologist by the name of Stanley G. Price. Um, and you can see in the right-hand side there, the, the, uh, this demonstrates how long ago this was. This was one of the salmon that Jeep studied. Um, it's actually a sockeye in the sock fossil record, uh, about a million years old. But So, um, Jeep was involved in defining a paradigm of oil toxicity back in the 70s, maybe even before, that uh, really thought that, you know, short-term exposures to um, some of the very light portions of a crude oil mix are the most harmful, and that they're responsible for killing uh, critters outright. So that was the old paradigm. And then under Jeep's uh, uh, guidance and with the help of his colleagues Ron Heinz and Mark Carls at the Auk Bay Lab, that paradigm shifted dramatically. So here's a wiser Jeep Rice. And um, just the beginnings of some of the pink salmon work that have really defined what uh, we know now about oil impacts to larval fish. And this all occurred at the Auk Bay Lab and was carried forward eventually by people in Seattle 
and then applied to larval fish in the Gulf of Mexico. And it continues to this day. Um, there are a number of studies focusing on large uh, open water fish in the Gulf of Mexico like mahi-mahi uh, and the tunas, looking at the, the uh, patho pathologies that were defined first at the Auk Bay Lab. So um, a major paradigm shift in terms of looking at the effects of very small concentrations of oil affecting the development of larval fish with implications not only to adult fish but to populations beyond. So the last piece of science that I wanted to mention had to do with um, cetaceans. And those of you who uh, have any familiarity with uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy will understand this particular statement, um, which ended with uh, a dolphin being the alien saying goodbye and thanks for all the fish. Um, before the Exxon Valdez spill, and actually even in the wake of the Exxon Valdez spill, people really thought that marine mammals were savvy enough and had uh, acute enough senses that they would be able to avoid the oil or avoid the worst of the impacts. We learned during the Exxon Valdez spill that that was not the case. They did not avoid the oil. Um, here's a shot that, uh, uh, that uh, was uh, passed on by um, Mapkin, uh, and it shows an orca passing through a slick, obviously not avoiding it. I need to be taller. Um, and a, a shot... Um, by Dan Lawn that shows obviously orcas not avoiding oil spill response operations. And then um, a shot that uh, the Auk Bay folks had shared with me um, showing orcas right at the stern of the Exxon Valdez. So obviously they weren't avoiding the oil and Jeep talked about um, Matkin's work uh, showing the decline of one population, the transient population in Prince William Sound um, and the slow recovery of the other pod that, that resides there. So this, this is circumstantial evidence, but it set the stage for what we began to learn in the Deepwater Horizon. And there we knew that animals were being exposed. These are sperm whales. These are striped dolphins. And this is a bottlenose in Barataria Bay, which was one of the most consistently and heavily oiled places uh, along the coast of Louisiana. And it's also home to a uh, local population of bottlenose dolphins that have been studied um, ever since. So this is really exciting work, um, sad but exciting work in trying to determine the impacts to oil exposed dolphins. And it's been a major effort on the part of marine mammal specialists uh, involving these sorts of activities and for these kinds of metrics. Um, so it combines a lot of different monitoring techniques and has generated a tremendous amount of information about both the effects of the oil and why these effects are happening to these animals. So um, basically, uh, again, I won't spend a lot of time here, but uh, so there's a, a lot of lung damage that's inflicted by oil. Um, it, the uh, adrenal function in the animals is also impaired, which affects many other processes in the animals. Um, uh, some animals appeared to have been killed outright, and then uh, very troubling is impaired reproduction. And of course, many of you can't read this and probably don't want to read this. It's the, the growing model of um, toxicology related to the dolphins that the marine mammal specialists are putting together. This is probably easier to digest, although I'm not so sure that this animal should look so happy. But it does kind of summarize the impacts that all of the marine mammal biologists and veterinarians are finding in these animals. And so what's happening with the, the growing body of knowledge about oil spill impacts is that people are beginning to realize that 
there are similarities in the way that oil affects all kinds of organisms. So even from um, single cell organisms all the way up to the complex vertebrates. So on the left, it's what the um, NERDA, the Natural Resource Damage Assessment people, like to call the constellation of effect. And so they're just trying to say here that there are commonalities that are beginning to be found in the way that oil affects organisms. And then on the right-hand side, um, it was a recent, it's just an announcement for a recent workshop where all of these um, scientists who have been studying impacts for the last 10 years got together uh, in Colorado to talk about some of the commonalities across the vertebrates and um, all the way up to humans. So there's, that's where we're headed with this. And uh, I think a lot of it can be traced back to the Exxon Valdez and the work that was started here. Um, so I think it's very exciting in, in, in a way that we're learning so much about the effects of oil. So quickly, what happened to the Exxon Valdez? Some of you may know this story. Um, so if you start in the upper left, the Exxon Valdez went to the um, Sea River uh, Mediterranean, or the Exxon Mediterranean, then the Sea River, River Mediterranean, and then just the Mediterranean. Then uh, it became the Dong Fang, I can't remember the, I have a slide here that shows. Um, they removed the uh, oil transport um, pipe, piping on the ship and it became a cargo ship uh, sailed by the Chinese. So here's kind of an accounting of what happened to it. Um, it continued to suffer through some unfortunate incidents in Asia and uh, finally was, uh, was bought for scrap uh, and scuttled in India in 2012. And even then, there was some controversy involved about whether it should be brought ashore because people were concerned that there were toxics on board the ship. Here's the last known shot of what was the Exxon Valdez in its last uh, iteration as the Oriental Nicety. Okay, my last piece here. Irony. So I have this collection. And I started this collection when I went aboard the Exxon Valdez during the spill um, to respond to a report that crew members were seeing herring swimming into the holds that were now opened up to the ocean. So this was in outside bay. We sent a team over to to fish in one of the holds of the Exxon Valdez. But when we were there, um, there was a salvage boat alongside and they had pieces of the hull that, uh, that were cut away as they tried to effect repairs. And so as we were leaving, we said, hey, can we have that? And so we took it back to the ship and the engineers cut it up into a lot of little pieces. And so in the upper left, you see my piece, my piece of the Exxon Valdez um, one of them I bought on eBay, but the other one uh, I brought back from the Exxon Valdez. And this started this collecting thing uh, of paraphernalia, memorabilia related to the tanker. And so you see a christening cocktail glass, somehow appropriate, right? Um, from 1986, you see an officer's cap in the upper right, uh, a signed first aid cover, uh, of Captain Cook. I don't know why Joe Hazel would sign it, but he signed it. Um, and then a copy of the uh, Valdez Vanguard from the day of the spill. So that's part of the collection. The, the other thing I found um, was a video uh, which, you know, I didn't even look at it until the government shut down and I had nothing else to do, right? So I looked at the video and um, it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be a, the christening of the tanker, but this was actually a documentation of the visit of the tanker to Valdez. And what caught my eye was the date, March 25th, 1987. So almost exactly two years before the tanker ran aground, the tanker came into Valdez and was honored um, by the town, um, its namesake, really, and you see on the left-hand side here, ironically, John Devins, who was mayor of Valdez at the time, 
and later would become the head of the Prince William Sound RCAC. Um, and then that's the captain at the time of the tanker as well as the head of Exxon Shipping. The other piece that's part of my collection, and I thought this was mythical, but it's a 1989 calendar from Exxon Shipping and the pinup photo for all of their ships and tugs for March was the Exxon Valdez. And you can see up at the top there, it says, take time to be careful. So those of us who collect this stuff, the Holy Grail really is a life ring from the old tanker. And um, I, I don't, you must think I'm on eBay all the time, um, but I'm not. And I just happened to check the site, and this was there. And only $4,000, right? Um, so I actually contacted the person who had this up for bid, and uh, that person um, was mostly interested in using this as a fundraiser for uh, the NRDC, the Natural Resources Defense Council. So she said, you know, maybe we could satisfy your weird craving to have this thing and um, our desire to make some money for NRDC. And so we combined our efforts and raised, I don't know, maybe $1,500 for NRDC. And they gave me the life ring, along with that video that had John Devins in it. And it wasn't $4,000. So, you know, if you remember at the beginning, there was this shot of me on the tanker. So I tried to restage that, you know, older and wider. Um, but he, here's, here's the piece of irony here. Somebody that I was talking to pointed out, hey, check out those life rings. There's a paint splotch there. The Z is rubbed off there. It's the same darn life ring that I posed next to 30 years ago. The exact same one. So, all right. So now you know we're at the end of my talk. Um, and sorry, you know, I blathered on about all this, this stuff. Um, so th that's my apology. Um, but he here's, I, I hope that you take home some of this stuff. Um, that it's important to think about the past. It's not just kind of whimsical uh, tripping through history. It, it gives context and it helps us not to make the same mistakes twice. Um, we get a little bit smarter. I think if you see the progression of how we respond to spills and how we begin to think about impacts to the environment, we get a little smarter. I don't know if we're getting any wiser, but we get smarter. Um, and the ability to separate environmental change that's being caused by uh, larger scale things, global changes, oceanic changes, um, acidification, warming, that sort of thing, is really important as we try to figure out how we determine damage. And so, um, and it, I think it's, it's very important to also acknowledge the fact that the scientists who were studying the Exxon Valdez back in the day and continued to do so um, in, in the wake of the, uh, the tanker really um, set the stage for broadening our understanding um, as we go into the deep water horizon research phases. And then my last thought is that irony can be both amusing and cruel at the same time in oil spills and in life. So, this is the slide that I always show when I talk about the history of spills. You know, why do it? You know, what's the big deal? Why bother? And um, it's just three quotes that sort of emphasize, again, the importance of taking the past as context for what happens um, in the present and in the future. So I hope that's the real message that you take, take away from this talk today. So thank you very much. Well, I think one of the things um, 
Mr. Shigenaka was worried about is that we might fall asleep, and I don't see any sleepy people out there. Um, we've had a morning and now an afternoon of, of talking about the history of what happened and uh, what we're living with today and that we're still trying to fix. But the important thing uh, is that we keep on trying to do that and learn from our mistakes. And it's good to have people who have been there, who have um, the history of it and um, the caring to help us to remember the things that have happened, th those of us who are not maybe living close to it or maybe um, outside of Alaska who don't still feel it like we do, but we know that the people in the Gulf are, are still feeling uh, the deep water horizon. So um, I'm glad that uh, we're all working towards the same thing. And as one of our other speakers said, this is the best planet. There's not another planet to move to. So let's keep this one um, strong and vibrant. And it's only through all of you out there that this is going to happen and people like Gary here. So we have a gift for, for him. And um, we want him to, even though he's a, um, he's a marine biologist, we're going to give him something from the land that uh, the artist is... Um, Mr. Tetpan III, and I think his name is Eric. Am I right? Eric. Eric Tetpan. Um, it's a beautiful bear, um, hopefully sitting in a pristine land looking out at a pristine ocean. And last but not least, we have a gift for Patricia. She's not expecting it, um, but she has been gracious in um, stepping in and uh, being the moderator, and she's excellent at that. And would you please um, welcome her to the stage? Thank you all very, very much. I appreciate this. And mostly, I just appreciate having all of my uh, Alaska Forum family here. Um, really, I never thought that I'd see Kurt give anything to me. <laughs> so, so, Kiana, thank you all very much. So we're, we're coming to a close here. This is our uh, last official uh, get-together as a group. So I have just a couple announcements, and I, I'll just remind you what's going on. Um, this afternoon, there will be sessions right up until 5 o'clock, so I hope you stay. There's a lot going on. There's more to learn about EVOS and a whole lot more on other subjects as well. Uh, so take a look at your agenda, and, uh, and then take a look on Friday. We have our first ever free Friday to the public, and of course all of you as registered folks are, are uh, encouraged to attend everything as well. There's a ton of uh, things going on Friday. There's uh, Hazwopper trainings, there's, well there's more than that. We'll have to look at the program, because I can't even remember everything that's going on. In grant training, a whole lot more. A Climate 101, learn how to communicate about climate change to other folks. So there's a lot you can do on Friday. Uh, we'll see how this goes. It's our first attempt at doing it. The good news is at 3 o'clock, one of the last sessions, there's going to be a live uh, golden eagle and three different owls here in the building, so you can have some first-hand interaction and, and get to meet, meet some of the wildlife we work so hard to protect. Art Nash of the University of Alaska uh, Fairbanks is hosting a tour of the, their experimental farm and their energy lab out in Palmer. And if you're interested, you can go to booth 46 and sign up. They have transportation and everything arranged, so that's a new thing uh, available for you tomorrow if you'd like to do that. Um, do you guys have the slide of our front desk staff? So these are the uh, people working behind the scenes, doing all the hard work. Um, thanks to them for tolerating me all year round. Uh, they do it with a smile, and they work really hard this week, and they're, I'm sure they're going to sleep for another week. So we'll see how that goes. 
Uh, I need to thank the, all of those who worked on the EVOS track this week, and Grace and, and Betsy and all the EVOS trustee council folks. There's so many extra people you haven't seen that work on this event. They are listed in our planning committee on, on one of the early pages in your program. And if you take a minute and you see some of those folks, please thank them. They all volunteer to do this uh, to help us foster our mission to, to better communicate about the environment. So uh, with that, I think I'm out of comments. So you're so lucky. So I made it through a whole year without a single joke. I'm just saying, I made it. Um, thank you all for coming very much. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>